Great. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you to New America for hosting this wonderful conference, and thank you to all of you for being here today. The topic for discussion today is what does the rise of ISIS tell us about the future of war, if anything, and why do we even care, and what do we even mean by the future of war, I think can be addendums to the conversation we're going to have here today. As we heard earlier, you know, violence might be down. Um, politicians and leaders might draw the wrong lessons, the wrong historical analogies, but I don't think everyone in this room would be here or be in the professions they're in, whether that be in the intelligence community, whether that be in a think tank community, whether that be in academia, if we didn't actually think we could draw some relevant lessons, see some relevant patterns that could instruct us going forward, both against ISIS and in future conflicts. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce the panel. To my far left, we have Douglas Olivant, a senior research fellow with the New America Foundation. He also served as a director on Iraq on the National Security Council under both President Bush and President Obama. He has also spent time as a senior advisor in Afghanistan. Next to him, we have Emma Skye. She's a senior fellow at the Jackson Institute for Global Affairs at Yale University. She served as a former high-level advisor in Iraq for both the United States and the UK government. We then have Barack Barfi, also a senior fellow at the New America Foundation, has lived in over seven countries in the Middle East and writes on a number of issues related to ISIS and the Middle East. And we also have with us today Hassan Abbas, who is the professor and chair of the Department of Regional and Analytical Studies at the National Defense University College of International Security Affairs in DC, and a senior advisor at the Asia Society. So I'd like to just open with remarks from each of the panelists, but just as some by way of background and thinking about the issue, we sent around some themes to think about in terms of what we mean by looking at the future of conflict, whether that be how wars are won, what victory looks like against ISIS, and what this tells us about conflict, how the role of technology and the media have been used in this conflict and how that can shape what we learn for the future, um, and also the role of intelligence in terms of conflict and what victory and defeat even look like. So Doug is actually recently back from Iraq. So I'm, I just, if I could ask you to start with some of your reflections on the topic today at hand. Sure, thank you very much, Tara. Um, very quickly, I'm, I'm gonna respond to the prompt as it's written. You know, what does the rise of ISIS tell us about the future of war? This is probably not what I would say if I was asked why is the rise of ISIS important or what does ISIS mean for Iraq or what does ISIS mean for the region? Um, but we'll talk about what it means for the future of war and I have a few brief thoughts. Um, it's certainly no accident that ISIS has risen in two weak states, one a failing authoritarian state, the other an extremely weak and fragile parliamentary democracy, um, which are under uh, constant, which are contested by three regional powers, uh, Iran, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, um, and one global power, the United States, and then of course Russia also playing a significant role in Syria. All of this has made this region extremely unstable, um, many of the areas very ungovernable. Um, as I told you, the good news about ISIS is it seems to only do well in very loosely to non-governed Sunni Arab areas. Uh, the bad news, of course, is that describes a third of Iraq and about half of Syria. Um, second, what we've seen with ISIS is an interesting development that I'm not sure international humanitarian law has wrapped its fingers around. Uh, Substate groups can evidently commit something that at least very strongly resembles genocide. And I tread very carefully here. I'm not a lawyer, let alone a human rights lawyer, international humanitarian, humanitarian law lawyer. But certainly what has been done to the Yazidi bears a very strong family resemblance to genocide if it is not such. Likewise, the Assyrians, and likewise, at least aspirationally, if not in fact, for the Iraqi uh, Arab Shia. We certainly saw this um, at the, with the capture of the air cadets at the Spiker base. The Sunni cadets were given an opportunity to renounce their errors in serving the government and let go. The Shia cadets were mowed down into shallow graves and or thrown into the Euphrates. So, I'm not sure, the, and I think this is important as my understanding, again, very limited, is that international humanitarian law at least implicitly, if not explicitly, assumes that only a state has the resources to conduct genocide. And therefore, all the monitoring agencies and the monitoring mechanisms are focused on states. And this may highlight why we haven't heard so much about, you know, we do not talk about ISIS, ISIL, as genocidaires, but it certainly appears that we have something that at least strongly resembles that. 
Um, third, soft power evidently works. Um, it is clear in my mind, at least, that the rise and the success and the rise of ISIL and its ability to find followers and its ability to craft its narrative is strongly related to the network of Gulf oil-funded Wahhabi mosques that are distributed throughout the region. Absent this ideological base, which is not to discount the role of other factors, multiple other factors, there's no single cause in why people are joining ISIL, but absent this, it is hard to picture having the large-scale recruitment from across the region and, as we know, into the West uh, that ISIL has uh, enjoyed. Fourth, um, as our historians noted this morning, in these conflicts, and I think in the future of war, the past will remain very present. When focusing on ISIL, past caliphates are extremely important. It is no accident that the leader of ISIL has chosen the name Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the name of Muhammad's father-in-law, the first caliph. Um, they are clearly looking back at, at history and reflecting it at least through an, ideal, an idealized uh, lens. Likewise, the actions of ISIL are reflected in the South through the lens, in many cases, through the sack in 1802 of Karbala by the Wahhabi Islamists of the first Saudi state. That's very, very present. And when ISIL was threatening to destroy Karbala, it's through that lens of the previous sack of Karbala over two, uh, two centuries ago through which it's, it's understood. And likewise, this would be impossible to understand without the understanding of what the Ba'ath regime means to the five-sixths of, four-fifths four to five-sixths of Iraq's population that is not Sunni Arab. Again, coming back to, to genocide, the Ba'ath party under Saddam Hussein committed acts in the north against the Kurds and in the south against the Shia Arabs that, again, if they are not genocide, and I'm, I'm not an international human rights lawyer and don't want to make that claim, but it certainly, again, bears a family resemblance um, to the attempt to exterminate a people or a large subset of a people. Um, and then I want to end on the note that I noted in the, the piece that uh, I wrote for Peter Singer that he's been mentioning several times earlier today that he published in Defense One. And that's something on the limitations of military power and the role that we've set for it and the distinction that I think we need to make between battle and war. It appears to me that in the West, we are setting war aims for the military that force is simply impotent to accomplish. Let me give a very simple example first that I, I test on my kids to make sure they understand it. If I'm a platoon commander in Southern Helmand, I can go to a farmer there and I can tell him, don't grow opium poppy because if you do, I'm going to destroy it. And I can then come back and if I find that he's grown the opium poppy, I can come back and actually destroy it. And further, once I destroy it, I can look at him and I can tell him, if you grow this poppy again, I am going to come destroy it. What I cannot do is make that farmer think, huh, for a host of legal and moral reasons, I ought not grow poppy. That is something that force simply cannot accomplish. And we t when we take this to the very fragile, weak state that we still find in Iraq, we find a similar limitation. We were able to remove the prior regime at, uh, at an extremely low cost, far, far easier than we thought we were going to do. That is very much within the realm of the force, and it may not be too bold a claim to state that the United States military could take, today could remove any non-nuclear armed regime on the planet. We have in our ability to remove regimes. What we cannot do is set up a parliamentary democracy and make it seem legitimate to minority portions of the population that do not enjoy the same amount of power and privilege and resources under the new democratic order that they enjoyed in the prior authoritarian regime. This is a, this is a realm in which force is simply impotent. And it's not that it's not well executed and it's not that people aren't trying the best they can. It is simply totally beyond their kin 
to create legitimacy or a moral understanding or a acceptance of a legal moral norm or framework. And picking up on that, if we could turn to Emma, and specifically I'd also be interested, Emma, in hearing um, some of your thoughts on Doug's comment that there's no single cause as to what gives sort of the drive to the rise of an organization like ISIS, and you know, what are some of your thoughts on that, on the origins of their rise and their, our ability to learn from that in the future? So ISIS is a symptom of a problem, and we need to better understand the conditions that gave rise to ISIS. In the US, it's very common to hear officials, very senior officials say, that Sunni and Shia have been fighting each other for centuries, that it's all about ancient hatreds. And this is just not accurate. The regional sectarian war that the region is witnessing today has been triggered by the Iraq war. It's an unintended consequence of the Iraq war. So the Iraq war and the manner in which we left Iraq changed the balance of power in the region and enabled the resurgence of Iran. And so this geopolitical competition that Doug mentioned between Iran and Sunni states led to them supporting extreme sectarian actors. Another point that Doug made was about the regimes in Syria and Iraq. And so the discriminatory and corrupt behavior of Iranian-backed regimes in Baghdad and Damascus led to many Sunnis calculating that ISIS is the lesser of two evils. And we see the symbiotic relationship between corrupt elites and terrorists. They need each other, they feed off each other, they justify each other's existence. So ISIS can only truly be defeated by Sunnis in Iraq and Syria. But they're only going to turn against ISIS when they see it cannot win, that there are better alternatives, and that they're supported. The US states that its policy is to defeat ISIS. But currently, US doesn't have a strategy to defeat ISIS. We've gone from policy to implementation without strategy, again. And so U.S. is aligned with the very regimes who helped create ISIS. U.S. is acting as the air force for Iranian forces, for Shia militia. And so if the conditions and grievances that led to the rise of ISIS are not addressed, then this cycle is going to continue, and son of ISIS will emerge in the future. Great, and if you want to pick up with some opening remarks as well and thoughts on the rise of ISIS. So I want to discuss ISIS's success, and I want to look at both military, uh, conventional military factors, and as well as social factors. I want to talk a little about theoretical and empirical. When you look at Arab weakness in war, people say it's two of the biggest factors are unit cohesion and tactical leadership. And the soldiers don't stick together when they come under battle pressure. The unit disintegrates, doesn't act as a team. They retreat um, and are pursued by the enemy. We saw this when the ISIS moved into Mosul. Many of the conscripts basically took off their uniforms and they just uh, dissolved into the population. One of the reasons for that is poor morale. Uh, as uh, the, the conventional forces have poor morale, whereas ISIS fights for ideology. This comes into the concept of what is jihad. And jihad, much maligned concept, my best definition of uh, jihad is the statement of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, you fight in the order that the word of Allah becomes supreme. In Syria, in contrast, the FSA fights for more worldly pursuits, such as wealth and prestige. They are easily discouraged through defeats. They're not ready for the long battle that has become the Syrian civil war, whereas ISIS sees it as an apocalyptic battle uh, whether they be waited for for a millennium, and they're wait, they're patiently, they can patiently wait it out. Tactical leadership at the junior level is also a big problem in Arab armies and uh, accounts for their defeats. You know, they fail to demonstrate initiative, flexibility, adapting. There's no imagination or creativity. 
Um, one example of this that we see in many of the Arab-Israeli wars is uh, once the enemy penetrates the lines, the Arabs continue to fight head on as opposed to worrying about their exposed flanks. These deficiencies stem from Arab cultural pro uh, problems, such as always deferring to senior uh, officials for decisions. ISIS doesn't have these problems. Its unit cohesion is very good because it fights for ideology. It has excellent tactical leadership at the junior levels that they make decisions on the fly. It's a more of a guerrilla organization. And, uh, these t some of the, and some of these things have benefited them both in Iraq and in, uh, in Syria. But there are more local and social factors that explain ISIS's success and control of certain regions. Here I want to focus on the city of Munbij in uh, the Aleppo, province of Aleppo. Unique factors were responsible for the weakening of the FSA and ISIS's ability to take it over. So what happened in, in Manbij is the, the, there was no FSA, uh, granted homegrown FSA, that rose up and overthrew the regime. The regime fighters fled from Manbij once the regime, uh, once the, uh, the city of Drabos, which was farther north, was attacked by the FSA. So they, it was a precautionary measure to withdraw from, from the, of those areas. So the popu local population did not feel that they had to any gratitude or support for the FSA for liberating them. The regime also was not demonized in uh, Minbaj because there was no brutal crackdown that was associated with uh, Babal Amr in homes, in um, Kafr Hazm, in, uh, in uh, Hazm in, in, uh, in Idlib and other areas where you see intense bombing. But uh, the FSA did a lousy job at governance. It couldn't provide services uh, the FSA wasn't organized. There were internal infighting about distribution of aid. And then what happened is the town began being bombed, just like other areas where uh, the FSA was. And the people blamed the FSA for this. So the people were mad at the FSA for the bombing. They're mad at the corruption. ISIS, in the meantime, sat on the sideline and watched as, watched as the FSA crumbled and didn't intervene in civilian affairs. It gave the FSA enough rope to hang itself. ISIS said it was fight, stated to the civilians there, we're fighting the corrupt FSA. So what happens is when ISIS attacked the, F, uh, uh, the FSA in, in Manbij, the, uh, Jamal Marouf, which is uh, of, of the Syrian Revolutionary Front, one of the brigades that we funded in Idlib, gave them town missiles and whatnot until they fled, um, he promised them aid, and he never came through. So people were even more mad at the FSA. The more civilian aspects of, uh, of, 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 of the opposition, uh, the Assistance Coordination Unit under the control of Tohail Atasi promised them civilian aid. That didn't materialize. They were more, even more alienated for them. But when ISIS needed support, it was able to draw on reinforcements. Uh, Abu Omar al-Chachani, uh, the Chechen leader, brought reinforcements in from Deir Azur. And with the help of some other uh, brigades, such as Ahar al-Sham, he was able to cross areas such as al-Maskana. They gave him free passage. So we have a, see an array of factors here uh, that explain how it took al-Munbij. Uh, in the city of Raqqa, we see more of a divide and conquer strategy. Because in Raqqa, you had several components. You had the FSA, the moderates. You had Ahar al-Sham, which is a Salafi organization. And then you had I ISIS. And ISIS slowly moved against each one of these groups. In June 2013, it kicked out al Farouk from Tal Abiyad in Raqqa. In August, Ahfar al Rasul uh, FSA unit was ejected when they bombed, used a suicide bomber to blow up their headquarters. And then the, the, the rest of the FSA had to seek shelter with Jabhat al Nusra for protection. So they moved, gravitated to the more radical organizations. So basically what I wanted to show is in these two examples is that ISIS uses different strategies in different locations. It all depends on local factors. And we, we, we tend to demonize in, uh, the organization. But I spoke to, when I wanted to find out what was going on in Raqqa yesterday, I spoke to one of my contacts who's still in the city. And he said, as long as people have bread and water and services, they're happy. The people here are tribal. They don't need all kinds of freedoms and whatnot. And they're, they're happy with the conservatism. So uh, ISIS doesn't do that in some other parts of Aleppo that it, it control. So when we look at the nuances, we see a lot of differences in how ISIS uh, attacks each area and tries to govern it. And picking up on that, you also recently, Hassan, have been to the region. You've met with top Shia clerics in Iraq recently. Uh, you've also met with Sistani. So you have a local perspective on what people in the region actually think about the conditions that gave rise to ISIS. I was wondering, 
you know, do you agree with the sentiments that have been expressed here? Could you give some of your thoughts bringing back what you heard from them over there as well? Thank you very much. I <clears throat> agree with many things um, that, that were said. Um, up front, I will give you my, my, my thesis on this, what's happening with ISIS, and then go into this. Um, why Shias appear to be some supportive of the counter ISIS efforts, especially the military means. Uh, why uh, many Sunnis, not only in Iraq but elsewhere, appear to be uh, kind of on the quieter side? Um, I would like to try to answer these two questions, building upon what was said. And thank you to uh, New America Foundation for, for organizing this outstanding conference. Um, I was um, the, the upfront point is. I think without trying to exaggerate of what's happening, uh, the, the age of small Muslim wars, if I may call that, is upon us. Um, and this age of these limited, small, transitional, temporary, dislocated wars are linked to the idea of political economy of war. The new buzzword in many Arab and Muslim states is you want to be a hero, it's time to become a cleric. It's time to wear um, a turban, it, it, irrespective of whether it's black, white, red, or green. Um, that's the way to prominence. That's the way to heroism. Um, why, how, how it is trans, transitioning in, in, in among the Shia? That's my first question. Uh, I was in uh, Baghdad the day Mosul was taken over. When I moved from Baghdad, some of my friends, a former student at Columbia University, uh, they actually took me uh, towards Najaf. I was, I met um, Mr. Sistani and staying about, I think, a um, couple of minutes walk from his home. I saw in the evening these big processions. Um, every 30 minutes there was a big procession. This is June 2014. Um, and when I asked um, my host what this is about, they said these are tribes. These are tribes coming from all across the south of Iraq asking and demanding Mr. Sistani that he should declare jihad or he should declare war upon ISIS and should allow them to go and fight it out on tribal lines or and declare an out, outright war. And that's what happened. Um, and I want to jump to my next point before ending the first one, what Shias think, because my second point will help me explain the Shia narrative and the Shia response better. So when the ISIS rose and with all the brutalities, all the atrocities, um, all the challenge to the state. Um, what was the reaction of the top Sunni clerics uh, from Al-Azhar uh, to Barelvi and Deoband in, in South Asia to other Islamic centers? They condemned it. They challenged it. But they were quiet. That's where they stopped. Coming back to the Shia, in case of Shia, Mr. Sistani gave a fatwa. He declared jihad on ISIS, but declared it that the, these militias or tribes or Shias who were not very well organized. I mean, they, this was quite abrupt. This was quite instantaneous. I saw it firsthand. He said to them, but you will have to go and report to military headquarters, different military um, forces in Baghdad and work, operate under their command and control. I personally feel what, what transpired later on that this was um, apparently not a very well thought out decision, although very proactive. Um, from our perspective in the West, um, something very categorical, something very forceful, uh, but not well thought out because we know who benefited from it, maybe unintentionally. It was the Iranians um, who came in in big numbers um, and fought. I actually, I, I had a chance to go to Iraq four times in last one year, um, and I saw this change in Baghdad. I saw this time in December, uh, big posters in Baghdad of Iranian martyrs who are f operating under Iranian forces but now the Iranians have those big posters in Baghdad. So yes, the fatwa against ISIS worked. It was maybe well-intentioned, not well thought out, because it led to the rise of Iranian influence. Um, and, and that is not being seen in a very positive light. When I met Iranian politicians, two things they said to me, uh, which I just want to quote, I'll, I'll be, um, to be fair to them and to my hosts. One thing they said, um, they knew I'm American, but of Pakistani roots, they said, well, the Americans couldn't find any Arab. They have finally found a Pakistani to send any message. And it took me some time to explain there's no message I have. I'm a mere academic um, trying to learn something. But the second point was more um, uh, forceful. But they said um, they, they were categorical even in about uh, in July, August time frame, 2014. 
they said, we can clearly see that Americans are now hand in gloves with the Iranians. Iran, they said, quoting them, they said, Americans have sublet the Iraq conflict theater to Iranians. And that's the coordination is happening. And irrespective of how I challenged it, and I said, it's impossible. I'm telling you, I live in DC. It's not possible. They said, no, this is what is happening. Coming uh, to my final point, uh, in case of uh, the Sunnis, why they were quiet? And I have one more minute. Uh, in, the Sunnis uh, never went beyond condemning it because there was a vacuum. ISIS never rose out of the blue. It was a narrative created by Al-Qaeda, by Taliban, by many such groups. We were maybe living in a fool's paradise, thinking that what's happening in Syria will not have an impact. It definitely had an impact. The narrative was ready. The vacuum was there. Someone just had to walk into that narrative. Uh, through, of course, media, through talking about the Ummah. And the last point is, from both the Shia and Sunni perspective, uh, what is happening is a war, an internal war, inspired by uh, Peter Bergen's last book. I, if I would like to write a book and call Islam's Longest War. The war is an internal war. And if I may inform you, this is not a Shia Sunni war. This is much beyond that. Uh, what strategy we have to challenge that is my last sentence. Um, I must congratulate whosoever is building that strategy. Um, in the US because they're keeping it so confidential and so secret <laughs> that no one the has only a thing they're keeping secret. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, just to pick up on that, I mean, I sit here and I listen to all your remarks and I sit here and I listen to panels around DC and, you know, it, there's a lot of deja vu to all this working on Iraq back in 04, 05, 06, which is when I worked on it. I mean, if we weren't talking about going to Mosul now, there was a battle for Mosul. If we could be in you know, November 2004 talking about going into Mosul and what our strategy be, would be in terms of informational social media, not as big of an issue then as it is now, but same thing in terms of informational messaging. So given that we're supposed to be drawing lessons about how to do this better, why are we still having the same conversations? And why aren't there more innovative ideas in the mix? And how do we foster that type of innovative thinking? I mean, there was an interesting question about the Silicon Valley entrepreneurship and why that can't be integrated in, in other areas of government. But why aren't we hearing new types of strategies, new approaches in these debates? And do you have any ideas on those fronts? I think it's, it's, it's the same people. Lots of people are frozen in the same time. Yes, this, this sounds a lot like 2006 and 2007, but it is absolutely not 2006 and 2007. We heard echoes of this earlier. When we first had the sweep through, you know, through Mosul down into Tikrit, there was lots of talk about, well, this is just an internal Sunni-Shia war, and this is the Sunnis rising up once again against this oppressive government in Baghdad. And that was the narrative for about two months. Um, and then they made this inexplicable left turn towards Erbil. And all of a sudden, that narrative didn't explain things anymore. This is just an uprising against the Maliki government. Why on earth are they attacking the Kurds, who had made it very clear they had no intentions of moving into the Arab territories. They were just guarding their own lands. So why this? And I think this is, this is showing us that we are dealing with something different. You know, are there aspects of this which are a Sunni revolt against the central government? Yes, absolutely. But is that sufficient to explain this phenomenon? A absolutely not. And we see that, again, in the slaughter of the Yazidi. You know, why slaughter Yazidi if you're mad at Maliki? Why attack the Kurds if you're mad at Maliki? Um, th this is something different, but I think many minds are locked in 2006 and 2007, the last time many of the people talking about this were there. And that, I think, freezes the conversation in many ways. And what do you think inhibits our ability? It, I mean, the White House just held its summit last week. It actually hasn't come up in this conversation. But there's been a lot of debate you know, in the press and in lots of articles about um, you know, what the strategy should be for countering this type of extremism. And I was wondering if you could speak, uh, if you could give some you know, recommendations on the informational media side of the equation on the psychological and informational side of this softer power war, what should we be doing, both globally and in terms of the United States? And are there lessons to do it better to prevent groups like other groups from developing ISIS-like strategies in the future? Well, the minute you embrace a cleric, that a cleric is discredited in the eyes of most Muslims. I mean, nobody wants to be on stage with the President of the United States. It's support someone who's on the President of the United States while he's giving presents made in America bombs. Right. Uh, the beat will publish that. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, more broadly, what we can do is 
So what happened in Islam, popular religion traditionally has been associated with Sufism and mysticism. It's um, very uneducated. A lot of the rural areas where they didn't have education, was, this was their type of Islam. Salafism makes that public enemy number one. Wahhabism, that's what they talked about, uh, building big graves. They destroyed the graves in uh, the, the, the uh, Bakiya Cemetery in, in Medina, the Shi'i Cemetery, other saints. So that they, they, go, they attack them from one side. On the other side, when you have the movement um, of, of rural flight into urban areas, there's a crisis of identity in Arab society. And what they do is they give up their their uh, popular religion that they were brought up on as they go through this crisis of identity and they rediscover themselves in more urban Salafism. So you have these push and pull factors that move them away from Sufism. Now, Sufism historically is non-militant, uh, more moderate. You read the Ignaz Golzier's book, Introduction to Islamic Law and Theology, which is the best introduction on Islam. He'll talk about that Sufism is the ultimate form of Islam and how it's compatible with everyone else. Well, for the, my, the policy recommendation is here is we need to support Sufi institutions. We have Habib Omar in ter, a city, Tarim, in Hadramaut, in Yemen. Uh, I visited with him uh, many years ago. He has a massive center. He brings in a lot of foreign students. We need to find a way to fund in Sufi institutes such as his to resurrect Sufism because Sufism has the message and the historical precedent and power to combat Salafi radicalism. Great. I want to also just make sure we have time for questions, but chime in and then we'll turn to the audience. Um, I, but okay. Respect. I love your idea. We having some interest in Sufism and having some claim um, to some association. Uh, but the, but and, and in, in principle, I mean, I absolutely appreciate your idea. But what, what I think is we in the last um, 10 years, from the United States point of view, have invested so much in this, this broader idea of winning hearts and minds. Um, and so much has been invested in seeing who the partners are. But the, at the end of the day, the partners that we picked um, were not evident of any consistent policy at our end. Um, if, if meeting Sufis and supporting them is a great idea, uh, but if in the morning we are meeting a Sufi and in the evening we are meeting a thug and in, uh, we are having a dinner with an authoritarian um, leader, uh, then it, all of them will lose uh, their credibility. So the policy has to be consistent. And even if I have to say, I would argue, um, given the internal nature and, and vibrancy of this unfortunate conflict within the Muslim world, maybe it's a little time to step away or st at least a few steps backward for some time. Um, rather than, and I have been uh, projecting this idea in Barelvi, Sunnis, uh, but it seems nothing is working um, in this regard. So maybe um, time to recollect our thoughts, rethink the strategy, and step away from supporting anyone. Support should be based on principles, absolutely. Groups, if our value is about human rights, let's pick partners who, who value human rights. Anyone violating certain level of human rights, Sufis, Shias, Sunnis, Ahmadis, step away from them. And if we could just leave some time for questions. Do you have something else on this? Yes, because I'd like to sort of agree with sure. Dr. Hassan on this point. When you look at what's happening in the Middle East, a lot of this is a power struggle. It's about power. By being in bed with specific regimes, that doesn't help. So how can the US play more of a role as a balancer? The balance of power in the region has been upset. The US can't be involved in internal struggle within Sunni Islam. That's something for Sunni Muslims to sort out among themselves. But the US can play a role in trying to create a better balance of power in the region and within countries, rather than supporting specific regimes who are discriminatory towards their minorities. We see this across the Gulf. We see this in many different places. Great. And we have time for a few quick questions from the audience. If you could identify yourself before your question. Uh, yes, the gentleman in the back. Hi, I'm Al Gombas from the State Department. Um, on that last point that the uh, panel was talking about, I'm wondering, um, while we can't have the United States get directly involved in these, these internal skirmishes within the, the, the religion, is it possible to try to inoculate the next generation with concepts that we would uh, find more amenable to us, uh, such as promoting the, uh, some of the principles in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, inculcating that into the 
the curriculum of the schools, uh, the, pop the popular media, the popular entertainment within these cultures, so that they're more sensitized to these Western values that we would, and not necessarily Western, because the Universal Declaration obviously was, was uh, adopted by every country uh, when it was drafted, except for Saudi Arabia. Um, but the idea that, that we can use these to inoculate them to the narrative of some of these more radical elements, um, granted that it would be a generational thing, but is that the, the best way to go? Um, is it the only way to go? I would support that absolutely, and I would, being a teacher and an academic, I would argue in teaching students who come from, to us at National Defense University from all across the world, partner nations, 60 nations. What I've seen is that mere interaction, mere dialogue, mere exposure uh, even makes a difference. So if, if, if that leads to uh, more uh, linkages which are educational, which are more professional, um, at, at a broader level, linked to institution buildings in these countries, especially if those are linked to rule of law, there's no need to always have the banner of democracy. Um, rule of law um, is at the core of these things. If there's no rule of law, there's no criminal justice system, there's no effective policing, democracy cannot be built. Um, and if, if we frame, we need to frame the issue slightly differently. Pro-education, pro-institution building, and, and th those interactions will, will help build new generations in many of these conflict uh, regions, which, 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 which will be better partners. Time for one or two more quick questions, because we're running low on time here, although I think we started slightly late May, from the I make one more comment? Let's, can okay. we do two lightning questions, then we can respond to those. So are there any hands over here that I'm missing? No. Uh, let's go over there, and then right over there as well. Hi, I'm Louis Bloom, a former fellow at New America, and I'm a journalist. I wonder if you all could uh, give your thoughts on how ISIS has used social media and video to project their power worldwide, and how journalists might work to not republish or publish some of these materials, how it's used to recruit, and how governments can uh, create a strategy to counter this. Great, and then if we could just get that one more question, and then the panel can pick and choose. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Jalal Mugani from Humanize Global. Thank you for organizing such a great event um, and thank you to the panel. Uh, I just had a question regarding how do we, uh, what are the practical, uh, maybe a practical recommendation in moving away from the sectarian narrative and addressing the true regional, political and economic problems that are at stake with the rise of uh, ISIS and extremism uh, in the area. Uh, if the panel could speak more to that, thank you. Great, so if somebody wants to take the social media question or the political economic. Um, I'll grab onto the political because I think Emma and I are gonna be in violent agreement here. Um, I think we, you know, this is an extremely complicated problem that has multiple layers on going on simultaneously. You have micro, micro level things and then you know, some, large, some large causes. But I think we do need to, at least in our rhetoric, acknowledge the problem, the you know, root problems. You know, this is not, oh, terrorists need jobs, but this is, you know, systematic, you know, large-scale unemployment of young men in the region, in these authoritarian regimes, almost all of which are oppressive to their minorities and in some cases majorities, um, is a real problem, and, and those are fundamental root causes. Now, I think I think we're out of the regime change business. You know, we don't we don't want to overthrow these states. The very limited stability that they provide is still better than nothing. But at least in our rhetoric, I think we need to be saying, look, you know, you you can cooperate us, with us on some issues, but so long as you're an authoritarian state that represses its minorities you know, provides no economic opportunity for your people. You're not an ally of ours. We may co you're not a friend of ours. We may cooperate on some limited issues, but you need to be taking steps in all these regions before you're, you know, on the team. And anybody on the social media question that was asked? So if you watch these videos and you read their, uh, their, their tweets, I mean, it's so sophisticated. And we know what they were doing inside the prison, how many videos they were making and recordings that never got published uh, by the Western hostages. Um, their, their ability and their, their, the ISIS's level of, of, uh, of, of use of social media against its Islamic adversaries is, is phenomenal. I mean, they're, they're a small percentage of, 
of the of the Ummah, the Islamic community. But when you look at the the the, the their, their tweets, I mean, they're just they're, they just take them apart, and they they the, the thing is, they don't really have good legal basis. I mean, they keep quoting the same three or four scholars, uh, but. They, 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 uh, they, how they attack their adversaries and how they, they're, they're, it's like a Clinton team. You know, you always attack. <laughs> that's, what, that's what they're doing. And, and sometimes their adversaries can't come back. And uh, how they recruit, them, um, the, they, they, they bring people in to, uh, from Europe uh, with, the, with the social media. I mean, we know based on some people that have come in, come in and defected, the, the pull that social media has, and, and it's, a, it's a new thing that we never saw in Afghanistan or even in Iraq, how, how it works. I did want to make one point about the um, education, about what Hassan said, and uh, how do you address it, inoculate, I think was the word. It's all about education. Um, so I, I've been reading this, uh, this tome of fatwas, Saudi fatwas, uh, at night in bed before I go to bed. And there's this one section on the infidels. And the questions are like, and the, the questions are addressed to like Bin Baz, who's the big sheikh, the big mufti, who died a while ago. And it's like, can we go travel in the land of the infidels? Can we work there? Can we study there? And the vitriol and the hatred for us, I mean, with how he, he characterizes is, is just so horrible. I mean, Bin Laden did not come up with the word crusaders in a vacuum. Uh, the, Bin Baz is using, uh, describing us as crusaders, even when they're just, uh, his, people are asking, can, he come, can they just come visit and see the Eiffel Tower? Until you address that and, and change the curriculum, you're not going to change people's views. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for all of your thoughts today, and I appreciate having you all on the panel on that not so optimistic note. Um, I'm sure there's much more we can discuss, but unfortunately, we're over time. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. I think they cut some